start recording now. Welcome everyone to uh, the Lifeline and low cost offers. We really did start out this webinar as just being about Lifeline, but now that needs to be broadened. So we're gonna we're gonna start it off by talking about the low cost offers that are out there because there are some that many of you are already using and we want to make sure that everyone understands uh, what's available and what's coming down the road. Um, so um, let me start with um, NDIA has, recognizes that there's a need to know what all of these different offers are. Um, we, we have compiled a list of what's available nationally um, that is a, real, a true low cost offer that's not a temporary um, marketing kind of offer, right? So we're not including the ones that are only available for the next 30, 60 days or whatever, but the ones that have an actual usefulness beyond that. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so we were hoping to be able um, to show you, to have a pretty version of, can you all see, can someone tell me, can you see the, um, the Google Sheet? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So we were hoping to have a pretty version of this for you all, and well, that's just not possible um, because a couple of us got the flu. <laughs> so it, it, it slowed down our progress. So, um, so what this is, we are creating this spreadsheet and we will soon have a pretty version for you to access on our website. Um, but the idea is that we, these are offers that we know are available um, and they are internet service providers that have um, at least some substantial kind of footprint in the US. There may be additional providers that we don't have on here because their footprint is so small that we're not aware of them. So one of the important things I wanna make sure that gets across is that you may hear about low cost offers before we hear about low cost offers. So when they are, when that low cost offer is coming from um, a good size internet service provider, we will share that as quickly as possible. But there may be some smaller companies that create an offer that you will hear about locally. So when that happens, be sure to let us know. So the, the first ones you see at the, the top, um, you see Cox, um, and then you see um, Access from AT&T, and then you see Spectrum. Access and Spectrum are both the result of merger agreements. Um, so when AT&T and DirecTV merged, the Federal Communications Commission said to AT&T, it would be great if you had a low cost offer for our disadvantaged members. And so what they created is what they're calling access from AT&T that many of you are already familiar with. Um, the spreadsheet, as you can see, ex, you know, shows when these end, um, at and says until 2020. So all of that same information will be available um, on the pretty version that we released to you all. Um, can, you, can you all mute, mute your lines, please? That will help cut down on the background noise. So the next one that's really important in terms of merger agreements is Spectrum. So that one's not yet available, even though their website is live, which is kind of annoying. But it, the, you can't sign up for the service yet. Uh, the agreement that they had um, when, with the FCC when the FCC approved their merger is that this low cost offer would be available uh, within a year of the merger approval, and that was in June. So we should see it within the next couple of months. Um, if, if for some reason it doesn't happen in June, then we will press for that to happen. Um, so know that we are keeping an eye on that. Comcast Internet Essentials was a result of a merger agreement, uh, but they have decided to continue it. And so we will encourage all of the providers who created a, a low cost offer. That was a result of a merger agreement and it has an end date because they always have end dates to continue it just as Comcast did. Um, the, the odd ones out in this are um, Cox was an offer that was created um, because the FCC went to Cox and just said, hey, wouldn't this be a good idea? And Cox said, okay, it's a good idea. So that's where their offer came from. It was not a merger agreement. Uh, Google Fiber on their own um, 
probably due to the pressure that they were seeing locally when they were uh, expanding. Um, they have their low cost offer. And then um, there's a couple of other cable ones in there. The, the, another interesting one to make sure everyone's aware of is Mobile Beacon and Mobile Citizen are nonprofit organizations um, that use EBS, which is Education Broadband Spectrum, and what they have partners. So you can't purchase directly from Mobile Beacon or Mobile Citizen, but there are partners that work that are resellers in essence of Mobile Beacon and Mobile Citizen service. So the bottom two on the list you see in blue, those are um, those, those those are. Oh, now I hear it. Now I hear it. That's not, that's annoying. That's annoying. <clears throat> so, so there are other programs, are other programs that have that the have Mobile Beacon and Mobile Citizen. Well, these two that are on here are national. are national. So those so you can those be anywhere and request anywhere access, and to request service. access to their service. The trick for all of these, including the, the PCs for people in the interconnection, is that you have to be where that service is available, clearly. right? Um, and so for those two, it's where Sprint is available. Uh, and the actual speed you get, uh, as you all know, with a cellular connection depends upon where you're sitting at the day that you're using it. Uh, so um, take the speeds listed, you know, with a grain of salt kind of thing, that um, it will vary and that needs to be expected. So uh, when we do release this, we will, we are working on a second version of it where there will be um, the, the other programs, there are multiple other programs, about 15 of them, that work with Mobile Citizen that do the reselling within their local communities. Uh, and those are really important to the big scheme of things because they show that in some communities there's not enough options for low-cost broadband. And then so those community organizations have had to create their own solution, uh, which they have done with Mobile Beacon or Mobile Citizen. Uh, so that's that's the, the quick and dirty on what's out there. Um, I apologize that this is a Google spreadsheet and not something a lot prettier. Um, any Michael uh, Limitad's referencing the One Million Project. I'm not a huge fan of the One Million Project, but we, we should share it. So Sprint um, has a project where they work primarily with schools. Uh, it can be other community organizations. Um, Everything that we've listed on, on our list is uh, unlimited data. And the One Million Project um, is not unlimited data. And so um, we can get in some theological kind of <laughs> arguments about uh, the value of having at least something versus the value of having unlimited data. But I'll save you all that. Um, we can do that at net inclusion when I see you in May. Uh, any questions, um, quick questions, folks want to pop into the chat about this. Um, we can get into this in, into some more detail after we hear about Lifeline. Um, so if I don't see anything pop up real quick, we're going to switch to uh, Olivia, who's going to give us the, the, the deal on Lifeline. And hopefully folks don't leave crying. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, uh, just to recap at the start um, how we got here. So Lifeline is one of four federal universal service programs and it's um, third in size. So it's the second smallest. It was created in 1985 to help low income households afford voice service. Um, and in order to participate in Lifeline, to receive a subsidy, you have to become an eligible telecommunications carrier. So this history, starting out um, in voice, is going to have some bearing on where we are now. In March of 2016, the FCC modernized the Lifeline program so that eligible households would be able to apply their benefit towards voice or broadband or a bundle of voice and, and broadband. The um, other big thing the Lifeline Modernization Order did was change the process for how people um, apply for the Lifeline benefit. So I'll go into a little bit of some of these shifting timelines just to put it on your radar screen. Depending on what state you're in, um, it may feel different from your neighbors. Um, I'm going to start off with the National Eligibility Verifier, this new process for how you enroll because there's a timeline attached to it. Um, 
So the national eligibility, it's, next slide. Yeah. Um, the eligibility verifier is being built out this year. The Universal Service Administrative Company has been in contact with um, benefits providers in, I believe, all of the states. And some states are closer than others in terms of being ready to be um, entered into this new eligibility determination process. So the goal in the modernization order was that by the end of 2017, at least five states would be using this new process. It could be more, but at least five. By the end of 2018, at least half the states would be using this new process. And by the end of 2019, all the states and territories will be using this new process. This was one of um, the efforts to address um, criticisms from uh, those who thought that there was too much, those who tried to limit the extent of lifeline by arguing fraud, waste, and abuse. What this does is it takes carriers out of the role of determining eligibility and instead puts an agent of the government in charge of that process. Um, the next slide is talking about um, the eligibility criteria changes. Um, as of December 2nd, the eligibility criteria for becoming um, eligible for Lifeline changed. So they streamlined, they picked programs where they could have a better shot at automation, a quick yes, no check into a database, a state run database to determine eligibility. And they also looked at the programs that current Lifeline recipients were using. So these were the popular programs as well as those most likely for the yes, no ping um, as they build out this national eligibility verifier. So the programs on the left-hand column are the ones that are the current eligibility criteria. The programs on the right are the ones that have been terminated. However, depending on the state you're in, you may still see LIHEAP, um, free lunch, and TANF appear on the eligibility application this year. So in the next chart, will show you that um, eight states did get extensions for um, aligning the lifeline eligibility criteria to the new criteria. So if you're in one of these eight states, your application forms may look a little bit different. You may still see some of those programs that have been terminated um, for everyone else. Uh, that's a handy chart to keep in mind. The next chart, moving into, um, who can provide lifeline broadband? Now this is a little bit, um, this is important context for sort of where we are now and some of the headlines you may have been um, seeing about the lifeline program. There are basically three broad buckets of entities that can provide lifeline broadband. Um, they're the lifeline only ETCs, eligible telecommunications carriers. These, because it was a voice program in the past, are are usually the wireless lifeline um, providers. A lot of them have the prepaid uh, lifeline product. They can choose voluntarily um, to offer wireless lifeline broadband. Um, they don't have to go through any special hoops. They can just start offering it. There are the high cost eligible telecommunications carriers, the second bucket. Um, and there are actually sort of two types of high cost ETCs. Um, there are those that are accepting high cost universal service funds to build out broadband internet um, access service and they've made it commercially available. In that footprint where they have due to their high cost obligations rolled out broadband and made it commercially available, they must offer um, lifeline broadband. Where it's <laughs> optional for them is like outside of that footprint. Um, then they can choose whether or not they want to offer broadband. And then the third bucket is where the headlines have been. And this is for that sort of new entity, the non-traditional um, broadband provider who's not participated in Lifeline before, the FCC created a streamlined process to lower a barrier of entry for them. Um, they set it at the federal level 
So as opposed to having to go to each state commission, um, the Lifeline Modernization Order created a an, a, an LBP designation process at the FCC. Um, and this is what, uh, on March, uh, on February 3rd, Commissioner Pai rolled back because nine entities had been approved to be Lifeline Broadband providers under this new designation process. And the chairman, the new chairman Pai, rolled back and said, we're gonna revoke those designations, sort of put them on hold. There's also litigation. Some, some states sued the FCC for this last um, bucket of LBP designations because of the preemption effect. They wanted states to still retain their role. So there is a case in, in court right now, but um, also in line with the chairman sort of rolling back on the designation for the nine carriers, the chairman, the FCC asked the court to hold that case in abeyance for three months to see if we can, this issue can be resolved at the FCC to give the FCC some time to deal with it. So that's where the, all the headlines have been. Um, so, which is to say that if there are current lifeline providers in your state, they're already ETCs, they can on their own offer a lifeline broadband product as long as it meets minimum standards. If you have some um, internet service providers that have been interested in jumping into the lifeline program, the process they would use to apply is, is not clear right now. And that's sort of the unfortunate sticking point we find ourselves at. Um, okay. So, but moving along sort of to just keep on going, um, there is, there have been a flurry of um, letters and um, op-eds about uh, Lifeline on one side of the camp or the other. Uh, there is currently circulating a sign-on letter right now. The FCC has an open meeting tomorrow. <laughs> so the hope is that groups would be willing to take a look at the letter which is in the next couple of slides. It's on the next two slides. Um, and it's basic, basically asking the commission to stick with the lifeline um, modernization order to implement it and to reverse its decision to revoke the, the um, LBP designation um, decision from February 3rd. Um, that that's sort of in a nutshell, like the big pieces of the moving picture. I guess the other thing I wanted to put on your radar screen is going back to how this new process for applying for Lifeline that's going to be centralized. Um, the Universal Service Administrative Company files a um, plan for how it's going to build out this process. And it filed the first plan in January. It will be updating this plan every six months. And they are looking for folks in the field willing to beta test and to provide feedback because one of the benefits of the new system will be that consumers will have more control and um, they will have, you will have the ability to help people enroll in Lifeline and you will be able to monitor sort of where their application is through this new process, you, you'll be able to track it and figure out if there are any hiccups and if there are sort of what particularly is, is not working to help people get enrolled. Um, so it, it, I encourage folks that are interested in helping build out the system, um, there's an, a, a welcome invitation to, to weigh in and be a part of this process. Olivia, could, and, you, could you go over yeah. um, what ETC is and what BIAS is. ETC is eligible telecommunication eligible telecommunications carrier. Of the four universal service programs, um, high cost and low income, that's Lifeline. Uh, in order to participate in those two programs, you have to be an eligible telecommunications carrier. That's not true for the other two universal service programs, the E-rate, which is schools and libraries, and rural health care. Um, and that is a process, uh, 
in the voice context has traditionally been handled at the state level. Uh, and that's why the states have sued because um, their interpretation is that the states must have uh, a role in being able to choose um, who gets to participate in this federal program. A lot of states have also built state universal service programs um, that complement the federal program. So they go hand in hand. There are some states, however, that have passed legislation that, that deregulate um, uh, telecommunications. And the result in those situations, even for voice, um, carriers can still become an ETC, but they, they would then be sent to the FCC to go through an FCC review. Um, what was the other question, Angela? I'm sorry. Bias. Uh oh, bias. Bias is broadband internet access service. So um, I just use it synonymously with broadband service. Great, thank you. Um, so a, a few folks are asking um, how to sign on to the letter. So know that NDIA has already signed on to the letter and um, I, let's see what's the best way to do that. I will put uh, the link, because uh, there's a, it's an online form for folks to sign on. Um, in these kinds of situations, it's always NDIA trying to figure out if it's best to get all of you to sign on or if we represent our affiliates in signing on, which we do, but it makes a bigger statement if we have more. So, it, um, so we're always trying to figure that out. So I will put that link in there as we are talking. Um, other questions that folks have? And can, if you're not talking, can you mute your line? Usually I can see um, and can mute folks from here, but for some reason I'm not able to do that today. Angela? Yes. Hi, it's Laura. Um, Laura Breeden, everyone. Hi, thanks for joining. Um, is there a way to like easily find out who the ETCs are already in the states that wouldn't have to go through a new process? So that, for example, if they're not offering it, we could lean on them a little bit. That is a very good question. This is Olivia. Um, in the National Eligibility Verifier Plan that was submitted, actually, yeah, um, in January, on page 42, um, USAC has committed to building a tool where you would be able to plug in a zip code and it would pull out all of the ETCs that serve that zip code. Um, we were told, Angela, remind me, is this correct? End of first quarter um, yes, this we year, were. This, this tool would be built. And that is coming up soon. Um, I have I have put some calls in to see the status of where where we are with that, but we are hoping within a month or so um, to have that tool available. But sadly, lacking that tool, there is a way to use the Universal Service Administrative Company's website, USAC.org, USAC.org, and we can send you the link. But it's a little bit roundabout to go into each state and sort of pull up. Um, who's receiving reimbursement for Lifeline. That's, that's how I figure out who's active in that state. But you, what is not clear right now with that disbursement information is if, it, if they're offering broadband um, or voice. So the new tool uh, should be able to distinguish the types of services provided by the provider. Um, and also to say that a lot of the, um, I shouldn't say a lot. This is anecdotal. Um, I, I don't think it's been published anywhere, but I have I have heard that um, over a quarter of the existing Lifeline recipients are now getting um, Lifeline broadband service. I, I believe it's probably through their um, prepaid wireless carrier. So it used to be a voice product, and now it's you know switched over. Um, well, but that it could also could that also be people who have voice and are also getting like 500 meg through their cellular lifeline provider? Like a bundle? Yeah, it could yeah. be a bundle. And that is going to be one of um, my jobs moving forward is to get more granular data on, you know, who, 
how this lifeline benefit is being used, right? You know, what parts of the country, what types of products. We just need that granular data to figure out like what's going on. And right now we don't have it. So, so we don't know who, we don't know who's currently providing Lifeline, um, just to make sure everyone understands, because the only way that we will eventually know who has a Lifeline broadband offer is that they've asked for their $9.25 for that particular subscriber from USAC. And then USAC then knows to throw them into the database, which is not yet available. But they're hoping to have the first version of that at the end of this quarter. Um, but still, even that won't tell us because um, if there's only a one if there's one person in one zip code who's using that lifeline offer but then the next zip code over nobody signed up for that lifeline offer then that zip code over won't show up in the database so um so um, olivia could you explain um to folks um about the um that even even the etcs who um want are expected to provide Lifeline, um, that some of them have requested um, permission to, to delay that. Right. Um, I, it is not mandatory that they provide the Lifeline broadband product, but the way that they make that clear, whether or not they're going to or not, they have to file that they're not going to if they're not going to. Otherwise, it's assumed that they will. So that's that process. And, and so and so the ones that were had the voice service still have the voice service. So it's just so everyone understands that the broadband part is the part that's being added on. And they can choose to jump into that or choose not to jump into that. And they can change their mind. Exactly. So it is it's going to be a fluid marketplace if um, and we're hoping to make it more competitive. So we really do need that third sort of bucket of ETCs to get resolved, the non-traditional um, eligible telecommunications carrier, the, the internet service providers, you know, that, that may have these interesting products in certain communities. In fact, one of the LBP designations, uh, Lifeline Broadband provider designations that got revoked was for one zip code in New York because it was um, partnered with a public housing authority and they were going to provide um, an interesting, uh, it was called spot on wireless and they were going to do a fixed wireless broadband offering with speeds of 20 down and 20 up with no usage limits for 975 a month. That was the spot on networks petition. So they would be like an unusual, you know, entrant into the lifeline marketplace. And, and, and while this thing is not clear, while this designation process is unclear, that's what we have, that's what we're, that's what we're not getting. So that's why people are urging the FCC to really rethink its decision to revoke this process. So from, from NDIA's standpoint, we know at least two of our affiliates are intending to become Lifeline broadband providers. Um, and now both of them say that they are backing away from that plan because they don't know that they would, you know, why go through the process when you don't know you're actually going to get, that you have a good chance of being approved. Um, and that's, that's a big worry for us because we need more folks, more Lifeline broadband offers, not less. So um, I put into the chat uh, the link for the NDIA blog post where we explain that position. Um, and I the the letter that um, Olivia had referred to on signing on to support Lifeline, I will post that to the listserv, uh, the NDIA listserv, again with the link as to how to um, how to add your organization's name to that. Any other questions that we've missed? Angela? Yes, it looks Laura. Like this one from Sean McLaughlin so asking whether the only providers that are obligated to offer Lifeline Broadband are the CAF providers. Is that? Olivia, do you want to clarify? It's a subset of the CAF providers. Yeah, it's it's the ones that have the commercially available broadband service um, due to the receipt of their high cost funds. So it's right. that sort of very small, small footprint. That's the only mandatory 
portion for the okay. Lifeline Broadband. The product. second. And there was also a question about <laughs> reading the tea leaves. What's the worst case scenario for this administration and its long-term plans for Lifeline? Anybody want to confront that? Oh, boy. Uncertain. <laughs> right. So, um, so, so that's why that's why the letter, right? That's why we do. So, so when Olivia and I were first thinking of this webinar two months ago, we thought we would have some real lifeline offers to share with you, and um, discuss whether or not we should cancel cancel this. Which clearly, it was a good idea that we kept it. Um, and it's important that we do keep talking about it um, because the the more that you all understand and the and understand that potential value then the more you are discussing that locally and that does and then with social media and signing on to letters and being engaged with any of the um, activities around lifeline um, related to which we have digital inclusion week coming up may 8th to the 13th and then net inclusion may 16 17 and we will certainly be talking about this again um, so so I think there's a hesitancy to read tea leaves because you don't know, um, none, of us, none of us know where it's going. We can, we can worry ourselves to death, um, but the more engaged we are, the more we can influence it. Olivia, do you wanna jump into that? Yeah, I, I think that some of the rhetoric, certainly um, congressionally about infrastructure build out, you know, whether people believe it's gonna happen or not, um, the focus is really on building it out, building it out, but nothing really on can people pay for it. And so I think the FCC hopefully will allow lifeline modernization to move forward full speed. You know, my I think a very real concern of mine is that things just sort of slow down, like it, it continues to move forward, but at a slower pace. As it is, we're looking at three years for the rollout of the National Eligibility Verifier because they're going to try and do it in a very thoughtful way. You know, start small and be iterative, right? You're building out processes built on feedback, and as things are identified that can be done better, they can be built better. I mean, it's being built in that flexible way that learns so that by the time, you know, the sixth state rolls in or the eighth state rolls in, that process will be a lot smoother than the first state that rolled in. And and you can sort of go to scale much faster um, and not hurt, you know, not have inter unintended consequences, negative unintended conse consequences, or at least minimize them. So, I mean, we want all these things to move. We would like for this to become a competitive marketplace. We need that zip code tool. We would very, very much like to, um, in, you know, entice people on the sidelines, internet broadband providers on the sidelines to, to jump in really, that this is a stable source of, you know, funding for a, a segment of the population that is often payment troubled. And all of a sudden, if you can, and you can leverage, there's a thing in the lifeline modernization order called aggregation. It's only a sentence or two, but that potential is huge. You know, use the lifeline, the steady monthly benefit from an aggregated population of lifeline households and negotiate an even better product. For those households that is possible but we need all these pieces to line up we need and we don't want it to slow down um, so I think that keeping in mind that this is the affordability piece this is the part that really keeps that universal service mission true um, should not be lost in all this dialogue about an excitement about you know digging more trenches so know that that's that NDIA's position, um, we, we often talk about the cost and we talk about the digital literacy. So that those are barriers um, beyond the physical access and often the physical, as you all know, because this has been our world for years, it's just now the world at the FCC also, is that they, the focus is often upon the physical access, not upon the affordability or the digital literacy. So one of the questions that, um, came through on the chat is asking about NDIA's lobbying ability. So if I, it, it's, a, it's a misconception that 501c3s cannot be involved um, in 
policy. We very much can be involved in policy. The restrictions have more to do with um, working towards a particular or against a particular legislation, but we can educate. Um, we're not supposed to um, try to get particular individuals elected. Um, but as long as we are educating as to the issues, and that's what we've been doing for the past two years, so going in and talking to the folks at the FCC or talking to elected officials about what it is that the local digital inclusion programs experience and what it is that you need, that is completely legal. Okay, any other questions? So it turns out I must have made a mistake somewhere because I thought I increased the limit of this webinar to 100, but we were still only limited to 50. So you're the lucky 50. There's a bunch of people who couldn't get on. I'm really sorry to those folks. Fortunately, we recorded it, and I will figure out whatever I did that messed that up. Last comments, last questions before we let you all go. Huge thank you to Olivia. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Bye, everyone. Take care. Take care.